Hello, everyone. It is I, Lord Xander. Or Xander for short. As most of you are aware, this world is about to be reborn in my image. In just a few short hours, I will activate the osmosis device, and a new age will be born. It's been a long time coming, and the journey has been difficult. I've been thinking about writing a book, retelling some of my favorite moments throughout my life. But to understand how we got here, it's important to first look back and recognize what got us here in the first place. Some of you may not fully understand everything that's happened, but don't worry. I, Lord Xander, am always happy to assist humanity whenever possible, even if the methods can be rather... <laughs> unpleasant. <coughs> Putting that all aside, let's take a journey throughout the most important past events. This is the summarized story of the Grand Theft Auto Zombie Attack Saga. It all began back in the year 1889, where a research team embarked on an expedition to Guatemala, Central America, at the behest of Her Majesty Queen Victoria. Among their groundbreaking discoveries, they found... something. Flowers. Subterranean flowers, to be specific, though one would think they'd be fungus, but eh, evolution works in mysterious ways. These flowers would eventually be known as Cocuflore Immortem. A botanist on the team found this to be a never-before-seen species, theorizing that it first appeared 52 million years ago. But it's quite possible that this species has existed for much longer. The team's moment of glee in their discovery quickly turned to despair when one of the crew members attempted to interact with the plant. <sighs> How typical of humanity, toying with things I don't understand. Anyway, it pierced the skin of the aggressor, and orange spores rose up from the head of the flower, dispersing into the air. A deadly poison, never before seen, spread to a few of the other crew members. They developed bouts of extreme violence and aggression, and finally, death, caused by complete organ failure. Realizing the danger this potential plague would be presented to the rest of the world, the few remaining crew members opted to destroy their discovery. To their shock and awe, they found that the only method of destroying these flowers was through fast-flowing water caused by a cave-in, which was detonated by a member of the crew. However, unbeknownst to the rest of the team, a chemist by the name of Adrian M. Gold had extracted a small sample of these flowers before the team could enact their plan. The overzealous doctor's ambition with the unknown drove him to near insanity, even causing a plague that infected an entire town. Fortunately for them, this was contained, as the infected individuals were all destroyed. Over a century later, Adrian's grandson, Frederick, sought to continue his grandfather's work. He discovered his research hidden away in a vault and vowed to finish it. He would later create the company known as Gold Tech. His continuous breakthroughs through pharmaceuticals and various medical enhancements made his company one of the most profitable organizations in the world. His life's goal, however, to complete the formula originally intended by his grandfather, was always his utmost priority. After decades of trial and error, he was able to successfully extract the unknown element from the Cocuflore Immortem flower, which he named Procassium. Completely obsessed with performing procedures with his new discovery, Frederick wanted to move forward with performing tests on humans. After years of trying to find a consenting test subject, he became so impatient that he did the unthinkable. He traveled to a hospital in London where he would find the Stone family just after giving birth to their second son, Carter. He murdered both of the parents and attempted to kidnap both sons. After a shootout with Scotland Yard, however, he only managed to escape with Carter. The other son, Jay, was placed in a child protection program where he would eventually get adopted into a foster home in the U.S. Which is a damn shame, really, since I've always wanted to hear Jake speak with an English accent. Oh well, can't have everything in life. Like parents for Jake and Carter. <laughs> After years of being tortured by Frederick Gold in London, Carter was able to escape his captivity despite his young age. 
Frederick pursued after the boy, but before he could recapture him, Frederick was killed in yet another firefight with Scotland Yard. Carter was then transported to the United States, where he would also be placed in a foster home, but separate from his brother, as there were no records to connect the siblings to one another. With no way of connecting his actual identity, Jake would be known by Josh for most of his life. With the death of Frederick leaving Gold Tech in shambles, his grandson, Nathan Gold, reinvigorated the company and it grew larger than ever before. Years later, when Josh was only 16, he grew tired of his abusive foster home and dreamed of a better life. He ran away from his home and met up with his friend Trevor Gold, one of the two sons Nathan had, the other being Kurt. Josh and Trevor agreed to leave their current lives behind and started a gang together. Two more of their friends decided to join them, one named Trent and the other Justin, who was also a member of the Gold family and Trevor's cousin. After years of committing petty crimes and surviving by the skin of their teeth, they reached the point where they wanted to complete an all-out bank heist. Before they could complete this, however, they had found another person that wanted to join their gang. The individual had no knowledge of their actual identity, so the group decided to name him Arson. He was given this name due to his innate nature to burn down properties, which was the first thing that the group saw him do, so I guess it fit. They successfully completed the bank heist, which made each member of the group very wealthy. However, something else was stirring behind the scenes within the group. Trent was secretly working with an individual named Seth Wattenberg who promised him more power and wealth than he could have ever imagined. Trent attempted to kill both Josh and Trevor at several opportunities, but he was never successful. Eventually, he was killed by none other than Kurt, who also decided to join their gang after a harsh argument with his father. Kurt's father, Nathan Gold, spent most of his life trying to perfect the formula that his ancestors had begun. However, it was far too complicated beyond his own understanding. Wanting nothing more than the acceptance of his father, Kurt decided to finish the formula and, surprisingly, was able to perfect it over the course of a few hours. Nathan was shocked when he found out that his own son bested him at his work. Realizing that he would be made a mockery if the public found out, he lied to everyone and made the claim that he perfected the formula himself. Kurt was furious over this, but his accusations were dismissed. He was even viewed as a traitor across Gold Tech and the public eye. With nowhere else to turn, Kurt decided to join Josh and the rest of his gang. However, that isn't everything Kurt was planning. Absolutely livid over the lies made by his own father, Kurt did the unthinkable. One day before Procassium was to be released to the public, he decided to poison the pipelines containing the medicine. He noticed something different in the mutation, however, and decided to inject himself with it to test its effects. To his surprise, Kurt felt stronger and more powerful than ever. Full of hatred and rage, Kurt destroyed his childhood home, along with his father still in it. Once Trent was killed by Kurt, Josh didn't want to surround himself by the gang any longer and wanted to escape the current situation altogether. He decided to join the army, but during his time in the service, he was attacked and captured by a group of insurgents. They forced his squad to shoot one another, and when it was Josh's turn to be shot, Seth Wattenberg's cousin, named Ezekiel, or Zeke for short, who was also on Josh's squad, couldn't go through with it, and he took his own life instead. Before Josh could be killed, he was rescued by reinforcements. His time in the army didn't get much better as he was attacked by insurgents yet again a few months later and was badly injured during the firefight. Miraculously, Carter, who had also decided to join the army, saw this occur and brought him to safety, all the while not even knowing that they were related. Josh and Carter decided to return to New York together, but they were quickly running out of money. Guess the GI Bill really didn't help that much, did it? <laughs> With nowhere left to run, they decided to reform the gang they had created. While on the hunt for the rest of Trent's gang, the entire city had suddenly erupted into chaos. Seth Wattenberg had been planning for many years to overtake the city and take control of it, and he was pushed over the edge after hearing the news report of his cousin Zeke's death. After a hard-fought battle to reach Seth, Josh was able to put him down for good. Once things had calmed down, however, 
Carter decided to resign from the gang, but agreed to pull off one last heist with Josh. Their final heist came to a sudden end when they were separated during their escape, and they wouldn't hear from each other again for quite a few years. Josh had lived a quiet life for a while. He even invested in a large house from the money he'd earned from his time in the gang. <laughs> wow, way to be subtle there, Jake. One day, he decided to invite another friend to his house he had made named Manny Armstrong. <sighs> Once Manny arrived at Josh's house, however, was when the first infection of Procassium had broken out. They bunkered at a warehouse where they stayed in secret during their time in the gang. They sought help from their friends in the city, and when they arrived at Trevor's apartment, they found him to be dead as well as Kurt, or so they thought. Determined to find the cause of the outbreak, Josh and Manny found the source of the infection at a nearby gold tech factory, where they learned the entire city had become infected in under an hour. They went so far as to travel to various locations across the city, including Liberty Island, to find a cure. Unfortunately for them, one was never found, and was likely never going to see the light of day. Months after surviving in the hellish city, they received a broadcast that Josh's friend, Justin, was still alive. After they located him, the trio intercepted another broadcast from the USAF, where they were told that it was Kurt's idea to release the medicine to the public. They investigated Kurt's apartment, but found no evidence of this. During their investigation, they were attacked by infected, and Manny was captured by a group of them. Justin was also left behind in the attack, so Josh was all on his own. He found himself being chased by Manny, who was now infected. Rather than kill him like all the others, Josh couldn't bring himself to kill Manny. After being chased around the city and eventually being cornered at the Gold Tech factory, Josh found a serum which he believed to be the cure and injected Manny with it. Just before Manny would strike the killing blow, Justin was able to knock him out. And much to their surprise, by the next morning, Manny's humanity had been restored. Now that the three of them were reunited, they realized it was far past time to escape the city after discovering that the USAF was going to nuke it. They narrowly escaped and thought that was the end of it. Oh boy, were they wrong. <laughs> Somehow, the infection had started once again several years later, and they were tasked by Steven Riker, a commander in the USAF, to discover the cause of it. They were given an arrangement to find and stop the cause of the outbreak, and should they be successful, their past crimes would be forgiven. It was explained that rather than nuking New York City, a prototype gene bomb was dropped in which destroyed all life in the city, but kept the infrastructure intact. After arriving back in New York and interrogating a zombie, they received word that Carter may still be alive and somewhere in the city. After a strenuous search, they finally managed to locate him after he rescued the group from being attacked. Their investigation of the second outbreak eventually led them to the Central Museum of New York, where their former friend Kurt was waiting for them. Not only were they shocked to see their friends still alive, they were even more distraught that Kurt had revealed how he started the epidemic. After barely escaping from Kurt's berserkers, a new breed of infected created by Kurt himself that were far stronger than any zombie type before, the group had received word that their former gang member Arson was not only still alive, but working for Kurt. Josh and Carter discovered a prototype 50 caliber round, classified as a B-58 shell, which they decided to test against Arson. The powerful impact from the shot had knocked Arson off a building and fell into the water, the infected's primary weakness, and was killed. The group found themselves at Death's Door again when they invaded Kurt's newly constructed base and were surrounded. Kurt revealed that Manny was still infected and was never actually cured. Manny turned on the group, and they barely managed to escape. Seeing that the only option to help their friend was to convince them, they were somehow able to persuade Manny and bring him back to his senses. Manny had a unique ability to turn into a zombie at will. Kurt's plan was to release Procassium into the atmosphere by finding the tallest point in the city he could find. The group knew the final battle against Kurt was coming, but they also knew that conventional weaponry wouldn't stop him. With Carter's help, they managed to brew a serum similar to that of Kurt's without any procassium in it. 
Ignoring the consequences, Josh decided to inject himself with it. He was then given the strength, speed, and durability of Kurt, but only for 30 minutes. When they confronted Kurt one last time, Carter was struck by a nearby rocket blast and the explosion ended up killing him. During his final breaths, Carter requested that Josh find his long-lost brother Jake. He handed him a necklace which he recognized, and it was at this moment that Josh realized that not only was his real name Jake, but Carter was actually his brother. Before they could reveal the truth to each other, Carter's life had passed. Oh, how tragic. After a long battle, Josh was finally able to defeat Kurt by having Justin and Manny distract him. With his guard down, Kurt was knocked off the Empire State Building and fell into running water. Kurt's death seemed to have caused the remaining infected to fall, as he was some sort of a central control unit in the hive mind of the infected or something. I don't know. Don't ask me how it works. That's why I decided to not use that approach when creating my infected. <sighs> anyway. The group decided to go their separate ways, as they knew, despite their efforts, the government would never leave them in peace. Years later, Justin was arrested for multiple DUIs and for burning down a liquor store. <laughs> burning down a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, that's Justin for you. <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> anyway, Manny moved to Chicago, but could never be free from the government's attempts to capture him due to the infection still in his bloodstream, so he decided to flee the country and was never heard from again. No one really knows what happened to Jake, as he left the country once Kurt was killed. All we know is that he started a family and went on several missions around the world to ensure that it was truly rid of Procassium. Jesus, does that guy ever sleep? Ezekiel Wattenberg, or Zeke, who was thought to have been long dead, was one of Kurt's first test subjects. He used him to continue his legacy should the worst come to pass. As Seth wreaked havoc across New York, Kurt injected Zeke with a similar serum to his own, and over time, Zeke would become stronger than even Kurt himself. When Zeke shot himself, it did appear as though his life was over. As the weeks went on, his wound miraculously healed, and he sprung back to life stronger than ever. Once he found out that Kurt, his former master and idol, was killed at the hands of Jake, he made it his life's mission to kill him. See, that's the sort of loyalty that I can appreciate. Thirty years came and went. James Stone, Jake's son, spent the last several years looking for his father as he suddenly went missing as a child and never returned. His search led him to Los Angeles, where he was apprehended by Commissioner Roger. Suddenly, another Procassium infection had broken out, and Roger was killed in the process. James eventually ran into a war veteran named Elias Cash, was also interested in finding out the truth behind the cause of the epidemic. Zeke had also created personal assistance for himself. The first was Dr. Diego Kion, also known as The Observer, a brilliant Russian scientist who had close relations with Seth Wattenberg. The second was Eris Desdemona, an orphan that had high ambitions and wanted to change the world for the better. During their journey to discover the cause of the epidemic, James and Eli had encountered someone named Maya Lockhart a skilled lieutenant in the National Epidemic Prevention Organization, also known as NEPO or NEPO. This organization was created shortly after the epidemic in New York had ended 30 years prior. Its sole purpose was to ensure no other incidents of Procassium would break out and prevent any widespread infections from occurring ever again. The organization mostly contained ex-soldiers and thugs with very little known about their backgrounds. No wonder the infection kept springing up over and over again. Once Zeke had begun terrorizing L.A., he demanded that the president, Arnold Vance, place an arrest warrant on James and bring him to Zeke directly. After being given the orders from the president himself, Maya attempted to apprehend James, but he managed to escape by fleeing the city in a fighter jet. Which, okay, that takes balls. He was shot down by infected and crash-landed in the desert and nearly died of dehydration. But later, he found that he was rescued by a strange individual who never spoke. 
Once he got his attention of bringing up the subject about the infection in LA, a silent individual decided to join James on his little quest. James decided to name him Cypher due to his mysterious nature. Once returned with Eli, Cypher had suddenly disappeared. James and Eli were captured by Keon after a fight with the infected, but were inadvertently rescued by a former prisoner named Edward Gray, or simply Eddie. Once escaping from the prison that they were held in, Zeke was furious with Eris for allowing them to escape, as she was the one in charge of keeping them locked up. Therefore, Zeke killed Eris without a second thought. Ooh, cold-blooded. James, Eli, and the psychopath Eddie reunited with Maya, who was waiting for them at Nepo headquarters, where she apologized for her actions and agreed to help clear James's name and stop the individual responsible for this outbreak. They managed to locate an underground facility where it was reported that the person responsible may have been located there. It was then that Zeke revealed his identity and how he remained alive after all this time. With the help of Eddie, they barely escaped from his underground base. The group then received intel that Keon had been stashing his past experiments in secure storage crates deep beneath the Pacific for several years. They were horrified to find that zombies were no longer dying from being submerged. Keon had intercepted them and revealed how he planned to steal Zeke's serum for himself and become the strongest serum user to ever live. Before he had a chance to kill them, Eddie took it upon himself to kill Keon once and for all. James had later received a call from the president himself, who had provided him with an opportunity. Should he manage to somehow kill Zeke, all of his past actions would be exonerated. During their final confrontation with Zeke, Eli was killed and James was severely injured. Before Zeke could put an end to James permanently, he was suddenly knocked back by none other than Kurt himself, who was somehow still alive. Kurt explained that falling into water didn't kill him, but it did severely weaken him and he had also lost his immortality. He was furious with Zeke for not following his orders as instructed, and the two of them began to fight. While this was taking place, Cypher had returned and was helping James fend off the infected. Cypher was shown to have remarkable strength which raised many questions. Eventually, after a long and grueling battle, Zeke killed Kurt for good. It seemed that James and Cypher were out for the count, but before Zeke was about to finish them off, Jake showed up and launched a gene missile directly at Zeke from a helicopter which made him vulnerable and killable. Finally, James was able to make the killing blow. Jake reunited with his son, and the president arrived as well with Steven Riker. Due to his remarkable achievement, they decided to not only exonerate James, but make him commander of Nepo as well. Good job, Jimmy! Months later, James, Maya, and the two highest skilled soldiers in Nepo, Gordon and Yvonne, ran into a mysterious individual in an alley, who said to them that, You could say I'm one of your biggest fans. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it was me. I had to get familiar with who I was going to be dealing with after all. As Jake was about to leave LA, Cypher intercepted him and revealed his true identity. His long lost dead little brother Carter. Oh how touching. Makes me want to hurl. <laughs> Carter revealed that after he was killed, Diego Keon had found his body and performed several experiments with different types of procassium on him. This made Carter Keon's slave. In addition, his memories were repressed and he did not have any control of his actions. One day, though, Carter just woke up and had all of his memories intact, and then escaped from Keon. Even though Carter remains alive, he is very much infected, and must inject himself with a dose of procassium once every day, otherwise he'll lose control of himself entirely. He also explained his motives to stopping the infection by locating and using something called the Osmosis Device, but he plans to use it by making every human being in the world an Enhanced, a being as strong as a serum user. However, no human would be able to live past the age of 30 and have a high risk of becoming infertile. Jake disagreed with Carter's plan as he deemed the Osmosis Device too dangerous. Their debate turned into a heated argument 
and Carter viewed Jake as an obstacle in his path. He attempted to capture him, but Jake escaped. The Osmosis device, a superweapon capable of global-scale devastation, was now being targeted by the world's most dangerous individuals. Its original design was to eliminate any single element on the planet, but was later scrapped due to the device's complicated nature. However, it could not simply be destroyed, as the device is nigh indestructible. Therefore, it was scattered into several segments across the world. After 11 years, one of the parts was found by Carter and his team after a long search. It led them to a Nepo storage facility, where they took the Osmosis part by force and managed to escape. James, along with Maya and a small squad of his Nepo officers, were dispatched by President Vance to investigate. When they arrived, however, a team of corrupt Nepo soldiers were searching for the part who intended to take it for themselves. After the battle, James and his team searched for the part, but it was already taken. President Vance and USAF Commander Steven Riker explained to James and Maya that the segments for the device must be found at all costs. Unfortunately, they also explained that not a single person alive knows where all of the parts are, as the individuals that undertook the task of harboring them have all been killed by terrorists looking to take it for themselves. Rather than searching for the device itself, they instructed James and Maya to team up with USAF's and Nepo's finest soldiers, Gordon and Yvonne, to find more information regarding the terrorists that stole the segment and stop them. Before they could plan their next move, downtown LA was attacked by the infected once again. The situation was deemed impossible, as the zombies were thought to have been driven out by the city ever since the death of Zeke. James received a call from Stephen, who told him they found the identities of those who stole an osmosis part, and it was none other than Carter and his team. Carter's team consisted of two other individuals, the first being myself. The second, Alex, is another Enhanced who seemingly has amnesia as he doesn't recall most of his memories. If you're wondering where I came from, <laughs> sorry. A magician never reveals his secrets. <laughs> now, you may be asking yourself, Lord Sander, why did you sound so different? That question is easily answered. You see, in order to prevent myself from being tracked, I used a little trick of mine that would only affect the minds of regular people. What they, and by extension you, dear audience, heard, was a false voice. Serum users and the Enhanced have only heard this, my natural voice. Pretty nifty trick, isn't it? Anyway, back to the story. Six months later, and despite the fact that parts for the device are nearly impossible to locate, another reading for an osmosis part was discovered. Concerned it was Carter, Stephen issued an official manhunt on him, but they were all slaughtered by infected. President Vance decided to contact James and sent his team to investigate. By the time they arrived, the osmosis part was already taken. They encountered Carter, who was adamant that he was not the one who started the epidemic. Huh. <laughs> they sure were some naive morons. After James was dismissed as commander of Nepo, their headquarters was shortly attacked by the infected, and the entire building was utterly destroyed. Ah. <sighs> Such beautiful destruction. Jake managed to locate where his personal helicopter was being held and armed a gene missile which had been previously disabled. I allowed myself to be engulfed in the blast, and I knew full well it wouldn't kill me. I figured it was time to move on, so I made Carter and Alex believe I was dead from the explosion. James and his team found themselves in some deep shit when they came across one of my favorite creations, the Omega. Zeke had attempted to complete his design of this very powerful infected, but was never able to quite figure it out. I was able to finish the design, but it's not without its faults. All that raw strength is actually what causes them to have some sort of a cardiac arrest. Therefore, I implemented a defibrillation system which jumpstarts their hearts. During their fight with the Omega, James unveiled a new technology that he and Gordon had been working on in secrecy, something called the Peacemaker Suit. In short, it's a nuclear-powered suit which gives the user the strength to rival a serum user. 
Not nearly as much as mine, of course. They made this breakthrough by studying Zeke's corpse, and it requires a significant amount of plutonium to use. Essentially, they're walking nukes. James barely managed to hold off the Omega in combat, and trust me, I'm just as surprised as you are. The kid has way more determination than I thought. Can't tell if that's bravery or just plain stupidity. Eh, I'll go with the latter. Carter had previously told Alex and I that President Vance may know more about the osmosis device than he was letting on, so I finally decided to take matters into my own hands. I infiltrated his office and easily took out everything in my way. It's here that I revealed my mind-reading ability, and used it on the President himself. I found every location of the remaining osmosis parts which Stephen was shocked by, as even he was being lied to by his best friend. I couldn't just leave without making an impression, though, and... Well, you'll just have to watch the rest. Cover your eyes, children. This is gonna get dark. Jake, now reunited with his wife and son, made their way to the location where Vance was killed. Jake investigated the scene and found that the gunshot wound came from Steven Riker's pistol, so they knew something wasn't right. James also revealed to the rest of his team that he had more Peacemaker suits being held which were ready to use. James, Yvonne, and Gordon suited up and decided to take the fight to Carter and Alex directly. I had instructed some of my infected to shoot down Maya. <laughs> Can't let her stop the boys from killing each other. Eh, I'm sure she would have been fine anyway. James fought Alex, Jake fought Carter, and Yvonne and Gordon backed them up. After a crazy battle, Carter underwent his mutation after failing to take his daily serum. James and Jake teamed up with Alex to take Carter down, and they managed to inject him with the serum. Carter was pretty pissed, so he threw Alex over the edge and was about to attack the other two. Before he could do that, he received a transmission about an osmosis part being moved at the airport. Without thinking twice, he ran after its location. James, Maya, and Yvonne went after Carter at the airport, and Jake joined them shortly after. Seconds away from Carter killing them, I decided it was finally time to reveal myself to everyone. You should have seen the look on their faces. It was priceless. Since I was in thorough control of everything at this point, I decided to stop using the false voice thing as well. But Lord Xander, I hear you ask. What about some of the other people, like Alex and Catherine? Why did their voices change? Well, to be honest, that was just me fucking with you. In case you haven't noticed, I enjoy screwing around with the natural order of things. <laughs> anyway, back to the story at hand. I told Carter how I'd been sending them false readings in order to lure them into a trap. Oh, but it gets even better. I also revealed how I reconfigured the osmosis device to never work in Carter's favor, and thus his plan to make everyone an enhanced was now impossible. He foolishly attacked me, but I put him down with ease. I also took control of Yvonne's mind and was having so much fun at seeing the pure horror on everyone's faces. This led to Yvonne shooting himself in the head, where he died instantly. I hate it when my toys break themselves. Jake begged me to explain what my plan was, so I figured, eh, why not? My goal is simple. Regress most human beings across the planet so they would all fall under my control. However, while I may command the infection, I explained that I did not create it. It was previously believed to be Carter, or rather someone that looked like him. The truth was discovered. The person that started the infection was none other than Justin Deshawn, who was commanded by yours truly to start the outbreak and kill his best friends, Jake and Manny. Crazy shit, huh? Oh yeah, Alex is fine, by the way. Jake decided to keep him alive for whatever reason. I told them that my decision to wipe out humanity was due to my time in captivity by Nullcorp, a radical corporation known for biological experiments. After years of suffering, my power was unchained. Though I may not look it, I am no more than 14 years old. Well, maybe it's 15 now. I don't really keep track anymore. After all, age is pointless to someone who is effectively immortal. I grew to adulthood as quickly as nine little years. How does that old saying go? You're only as old as you feel? 
Rather fitting in this situation, ain't it? Charlene discovered that Catherine, an investigative journalist who previously had dealings with Alex, had been tracking the movement of my infected for some time. She found herself at a quarry where the zombies were intending to dig out a segment of the osmosis device. Charlene contacted Jake and informed him of this. Jake told Catherine to move the part out of that location, which she barely managed to do. Jake also told me the coordinates of where an osmosis part was being dug up, and not gonna lie, I was a little thrown off by that. The old fucker really has some tricks up his sleeves. Alex later intervened, and the group fled the area. Needless to say, but Alex decided to join them. James was in some pretty bad shape thanks to yours truly. I mean, I couldn't mind control him, I couldn't read his thoughts, so might as well have some fun. I more or less rearranged his entire internal anatomy and crushed its pancreas. He's gonna be diabetic for the rest of his life. <laughs> anyway. They brought James to a yacht owned by Marcus Arkwright, the CEO of Arkwright Industries and a financial investor that Alex had worked with for a while. They were ambushed by Infected, and the battle seemed all but lost to them, but Carter intervened in the middle of the battle. So it's safe to say he's on their side at this point, too. They were forced to retreat as the yacht was destroyed in a massive explosion. Jake gave everyone hopeful talk or whatever, then led them to a new headquarters called the New Horizon, a large underground bunker. I wish I could find its location. That would be one less thorn in my side, but oh well. As Catherine was being pursued by Infected, I stepped in, creeped the hell out of her, and took back the osmosis part that she was carrying. She was captured, but was rescued by Marcus, who received a transmission from her. During her captivity, she learned that the infected were in possession of nuclear weapons, and this freaked the hell out of Marcus. So our heroes... <clears throat> made an attempt to stop the nukes from launching. Their plan failed, of course. I mean, is it really all that surprising? I'm the one who came up with the plan, after all. The nukes were launched before they could even reach them, wiping out a third of the human population all across the globe. Carter and Alex found themselves inside a rigged server room which detonated with explosive and procassium blasts. At a submarine where the nukes were being launched from, Jake and Gordon were in a similar predicament, as the submarine was rigged to blow with procassium. As for the remote detonator, it never existed to begin with, which made James and Maya's plan futile. Seeing glimpses of the people he lost, James lost control of himself and ended up falling several stories which caused him to become severely injured again. James disappeared, and Jake and Mai revealed to everyone that he'd been suffering from a serious mental condition. They knew it was only a matter of time before he hurt himself or someone else. They tracked him down and brought him back to their base, but his mind was pretty fucked up. Or so they thought. Jake convinced his son to stop being crazy, so they hugged it out. <coughs> Not much of a mental illness then, is it? Jake tasked his son with traveling around the world and gathering as many allies as possible for the inevitable final battle. Maya joined him as well, because they know that guy was going to go batshit insane again if he went all around the world by himself. Oh yeah, and Alex had a seizure for some reason. Gordon had put together some kind of special medicine he was working on that he injected into Alex, which made him calm down. When Alex woke up, he said that he remembered everything. <coughs> sure, buddy, whatever you say. Alex claimed he was no longer receiving any memory flashes from his past, but still couldn't recall everything that happened to him. I bet Alex has never met an alcoholic or a druggie before. Anyway, he told them everything that he remembered, but it didn't really do them any good. So, elsewhere, I managed to nearly complete the osmosis device and only had one part left to finish it. I came up with the ingenious idea of luring out all of the morons to my location by allowing the radiation to seep out from the part, which would undoubtedly get detected by them. Catherine had been following Infected for a while, who were heading to my location, and she revealed this information to Marcus. Marcus told this to everyone at the New Horizon base, so they came up with a brilliant idea to try and fight me. Long story short, it didn't really end well for them. Thanks to my newly found power of telekinesis, the osmosis part was long gone, and Carter and Alex were getting their asses handed to them by yours truly. Despite Carter's impressive strength by beating two Omegas with his mustard power, it was no match for my own. I also brought down the helicopter that Catherine, Jake, and Gordon were in. This really pissed off Alex, and he exploded with rage. He caught me off guard with that first punch somehow, but 
This battle was also short-lived as I punched a hole straight through his gut. Before I could finish anyone else off, Marcus showed up with another peacemaker suit and he tried to fight me. Ah, <sighs> when are these dumbasses ever going to learn? So Marcus bought them enough time to escape and decided to blow himself up after the peacemaker suit became too unstable. Eh, ah, better him than me. Alex also decided to walk away from the group as he felt quite hopeless. That's the spirit, buddy. Giving up on trying to defeat me is not stupid. It's quite possibly the most intelligent thing you can do. Jake got a call from the USAF and decided to check it out. He discovered that Steven was still alive. Well, yeah, of course I let that guy go. I'm not a complete monster, you know. Steven said he may know how to find Manny's location. So, once Steven got reunited with the group, he revealed that Manny wanted to join them in their fight against Zeke, but once he died, he just left for some reason. Later on, a radiation spike shot up and the group went after it. They were literally seconds away from dying after being ambushed, and it was glorious. But then, Manny came in and saved the day. They also snagged an osmosis part, which was pretty annoying. I decided to use another ability and communicate with Carter directly through his mind. No, I can't control the minds of other Enhanced, but I can talk to them no matter where they are. Think of it as a telephone conversation, just without the telephone. So I tell Carter to bring back the osmosis part or else their old friend Justin would suffer the consequences. As expected, they went after him and tried to convince him to be normal again. <laughs> Whatever that means. They decided to use Gordon's calming medicine that he'd used on Alex, but made it less lethal to hopefully work on regular people. Carter injected him with it, and sure enough, Justin was back to his original self. So you're probably thinking to yourself, Damn, all of this must be really pissing off Xander right now. Well, okay, I was a little angry, but not too much. You see, after the whole group reunited with each other and said how happy they were to see one another and blah blah blah, I contacted Carter through his mind again and demanded he return the osmosis part, or else his secretive wife Meryl would suffer the consequences. Oh yeah, Carter was married once. Try imagining that for five seconds. As expected, Carter brought the osmosis part directly to me, and now I had all the parts for the device ready to go. I let Carter go, cause keeping him alive is just too much fun. Why destroy things you have too much enjoyment with? Doesn't make much sense now, does it? So Carter reunites with everyone, and they all decide that in the grand scheme of things, it was only a matter of time before I would have found it anyway. I mean, they're not wrong. After explaining their plan for a final assault, Jake pulled a select few aside and revealed that James is immune to procassium. That explains so much! No wonder I couldn't read his mind before. So they all party and get drunk together or whatever. Well, if you're gonna die, might as well go out smiling. Unless you're Jake Stone. <laughs> you see, while everyone was getting ready, Jake wasn't with them, and this made everyone concerned. Jake somehow had found out where I was, which wasn't really relevant to me, because all I cared about was that THE Jake Stone decided to confront me all by himself. How stupid. Brave, but ultimately stupid. And that's where Jake's story comes to an unceremonious end, by having my infected and myself put an end to his miserable little life. Also, Alex made his way back to LA, so who knows what he's going to try to do. He'll probably try to fight me, but he's welcome to try. And there you have it, folks. That's the entire story of the GTA Zombie Attack Saga thus far. I left out some details here and there, but I'm in a bit of a time crunch. I'm busy completing the osmosis device. It's almost time for it to be activated, and the world will be forever changed. Humanity may try their very best to do everything to stop me, I'm sure. And I'm very much looking forward to it. After all, no big changes ever happen to the world without a big bang. Regardless, whatever's going to happen, it's been a wild and fun ride. Just try not to be too disappointed when I'm the one that will obviously end up winning in the end. <laughs> Now, 
now, if you'll excuse me, I have a personal journal to record. Ciao!